Welcome to Monarchist Minute. I'm Victor Smith. As we woke up this morning in real time, we learned about the assassination of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Mr. Abe was shot at around 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time, around about 12.30 local time on Saturday, on Friday in Japan. Abe was Japan's longest serving prime minister and his accomplishments for the country are too numerous to name here. We dedicate this episode to his memory. And now we pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. And now for a quick explanation of the Japanese view on death. Here is our regular guest, Darth Kilhoon. Darth. All right. Um, so basically, the Japanese culture of death is based around their animist religion called Shinto. Shinto is an ancient ancient religion, kind of like Hinduism, where it kind of developed independently in all different parts of Japan, but had its central core, especially around the emperor. Um, uh, and the, uh, I forget the name of the emperor's throne off the top of my head. But uh, that's where... But uh, that's where the... Uh, the animating spirit of the, you could kind of say the Japanese people emanate from, it em emanates from the emperor, which is quite literally a uh, descendant of the sun god. I forget the sun god's name. But uh, onto their views on death. Death is not necessarily, not necessarily meant to be mourned, but meant to be celebrated because death is just another stage of life. When you die in the Shinto tradition, you go into this stage of 40 days in the spirit realm, your soul going into the spirit realm on its journey back to life, where after the 40 days in the, in the spiritual, they come back into the temporal, born again as another child in this life. So mark your calendars down 40 days from now and... Shinzo Abe should be reborn, at least in the Shinto tradition, in uh, another Japanese child. You, Darth, and the suspect, a man in his 40s, is in Japanese police custody, and he admitted to shooting Abe with a homemade weapon. Speaking of killing people with homemade weapons, we will now turn to what President Biden has said regarding abortion back home today. And with that, here's Charles York. Uh, okay, uh, we moved on a little bit before uh, I think we were ready, but I uh, did say make it quick, so I guess my bad. Uh, but anyways, so uh, President Biden has decided to issue an executive order uh, because he is upset over the whole Roe v. Wade being overturned thing. So he is essentially trying to do his best to uh, circumnavigate the ruling, um, this executive order contains a directive for the uh, HHS uh, to, if my understanding of how this works isn't correct, then I, I'll be free to correction, but uh, he's mandating that the HHS uh, treat abortion as a legitimate, how do I, how do I describe this? Uh, legitimate. Essentially, he's he's using the HHS, which isn't in the Constitution or one of the original departments or anything like that, to try to get abortion uh, legalized nationally. Uh, this this executive order also includes uh, a lot for uh, about uh, you know increasing uh, access to contraceptives, uh, and also, uh, and, you know, uh, let's see, it might also include 
uh, pushes to make doctors understand what their oath oath is or something like that, you know, because you know, you obviously when you take an oath to do no harm, that obviously doesn't include children. Uh, so, yeah, uh, very cringe, uh, a very mm, it it's not good. Uh, and hopefully someone will sue and hopefully the Supreme Court will maintain its spine that it apparently recently developed and uh, get this stupid executive order thrown out before it can do too much damage. Uh, yeah, but this episode might have to be called Happy Days Are Not Here Again because of that. Uh, so, Well, uh, there, we there never was any happy days. I mean, you got to realize that the establishment are not going to allow such a blow to go unanswered. They're always going to strike back um, 10 times harder than what wounds we inflict upon them. Well, there is there is some good news about executive orders, and that's they're not legally bonding like um, congressional laws. Usually executive orders are made for the sole purpose of the president um, regulating and legislating on the agencies that exist under him and underneath the cabinet minister. So good news is they're easily overruled by Congress. So if the Republicans manage to take the House and the Senate, and they can easily throw out the executive order just as easily as the Supreme Court could overrule it if it went to court. Although the caveat is is that the midterms are a while away and the inauguration of a of that speculative red wave is also a little bit a ways. And there's uh, a lot that can happen in, in the intervening time. Uh, but the... Also, I, I'm not going to discuss the thing that Susan would strike this down, but remember, fortified, guys, fortified. Oh the ca- oh 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 the the no uh, the, 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 the big let's, the big let's, white let's building keep, you mean anyway let's keep yes. let's keep let's well, let's move on no 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 uh I mean we gotta um I mean we can get into uh the discussion uh the the philosophical discussion about how a monarch would be would be involved in this sort of situation a real monarch um but but I mean the fact the fact remains that from a constitutional standpoint. I ain't no cons- now. I ain't no fancy constitutional scholar like uh, one Barack Obama. Uh, <laughs> yes, that was apparently his job before he became a senator, but or uh, he was a constitutional lawyer. Anyways, uh, I ain't no fancy constitutional scholar, but uh, I, this this whole thing seems seems completely bogus on the surface of it because if the Supreme Court's ruling is that abortion is a issue left to the states, which I mean, life. I mean, you know, shall not be deprived of life, liberty, and property as a as a without due process of law as a federal right, but whatever. Um, if it's if the ruling is is that this is reserved for the states, then this then the uh, executive order is completely ludicrous on the face of it, and a congressional law would be uh, ludicrous on the face of it. Although since although uh, the policy of the Supreme Court in recent decades has has been if Congress. Uh, passes a law is totally constitutional no matter what the law says because you know obviously congress isn't bound by the constitution but that's just me ranting at the supreme court again <laughs> so uh yeah anyone else have anything before we move on to the philosophical thingy majigger well remember how power actually functions it doesn't matter what constitutions and pieces of paper say if somebody or some group of individuals has the power and they exercise that power their power is going to be done yeah, yeah. That, that's a simple machiavelli right there i think this and, and also matters and this particular event is going to put a lot of the um precedent law a lot of the um precedent power based off of the Supreme Court's authority established in their ability to interpret the Constitution to the test. And it'll be interesting to see what institutions, what interest groups, and what powers at play will come out on top. Although... Oh, sorry. 
originally wasn't wasn't the the Senate supposed to do this whole thing, and then uh, was it Mulberry versus Madison? Uh, the Supreme Court essentially uh, usurped that uh, right of uh, constitutional review. I don't, I don't know what way. it was like originally, but in either case, um, let's. Uh, I'm going to just make one final point here, and I'm going to hammer this home. The Democrat Party, after the Roe decision was handed down, had 50 years to codify it into actual law. They failed. So they failed. They didn't, I don't think they even tried. I mean, the, the, okay, I mean, for, for whatever which is reason. Something, which, is some, which is something that the people of the Democrat Party might want to hammer home for primary challengers and etc., but I'm getting way ahead of myself. Well, I mean, the the fact remains, I don't know, the American system, the way that we're set up is is just the, I don't know. The fact remains is that every politician, we, we love to talk about the Constitution, your government class, if you had one in school, and I'm going to hope that at least there was some civics course in your education. Uh, you know, we all learn the basics of how the three branches of government work on paper and the checks and balances and the okay, but never have have I I don't know. It it seems so odd to me that an entire country who who spends all their time focused on this piece of paper. Uh, and I'm using an attention. Uh, I guess my from now on my use of piece of paper is going to be more intentionally derogatory. Um, you know, it's a piece of paper that we all love and whatnot. Our, one of our most famous warships is named after it. Uh, you know, uh, although I'm not sure the designers or the namers were. You know, uh, they knew that that was going to be the the forget the original six. But anyways, um, you know, we, we do all this, this, that, and that. But then we're completely willing to disregard that piece of paper for seemingly moral reasons anyways, whether or not those seemingly moral reasons are actually moral or not. Um, I mean... <laughs> I mean, you know, what? Which is it? Is the Constitution the supreme law of the land, or or is is the morality the supreme law of the land? Now, obviously, morals would trump this piece of paper. You know, you know, proper how the world actually works and the divine law trumps this piece of paper. But uh, why do we act like the Constitution is this all powerful thing, and it should be a scandal if anybody? Uh, tries to do something outside the Constitution when that's half of what Congress and the President and the Supreme Court do anyways. Uh, uh, which is it? That's that simply because... In the sacred scrolls, but the sacred scrolls are up for interpretation. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it might as well be the Protestant view of a piece of paper. Uh, it's up to my own interpretation, guys. If only there was somebody that was actually designed but, by this piece of paper to interpret it. But, oh, but remember, but remember, constitutions are just a piece of paper written by men, not written by the divine. They can be overturned, they can be changed, they can be altered at whim. They do not matter in the grand scheme of things. What matters truly is the morality of the people. And the morality of the rulers, and we have had we have had immoral rulers since day one of this nation, and that's not going to change. I think um Joe Rogan he made a funny skit about the Constitution once. He's like he impersonated Thomas Jefferson, and the line of the skit was, "You haven't written anything new." I wrote oh, yeah. candlelight. I wrote this with a quill pen. You put men on the moon and you still haven't written anything new? We have. It's just I'm... that some of the additions were stupid, like letting uh, the people vote for their senators directly. Or, or... Like let, or like letting women vote. 
Or Pro- Prohibition was by far the dumb. I don't even understand why Prohibition had to be physically put into the Constitution. Specific- well, because, okay, okay, in fairness, I think that there was still an understanding back in the day that you that the that Congress couldn't do just whatever it wanted. There actually had to be, because Congress couldn't regulate, um, couldn't, it was nowhere in the Constitution did it say, uh, we can ban alcohol. That's that wasn't a power delegated to Congress. Uh, so yeah, could... at least they understood that. At least some of them. At least I hope they actually believed that they had to do this. But you know, nowadays they could have just pretended it was totally in the Constitution all along, and this is what the founders would have wanted, guys. Totally. Well, I mean, uh, there is the uh, point that prohibition was made by a bunch of Protestant women to get the Catholic men. <laughs> to stop drinking after mass and to tame those filthy degrades from ireland germany italy etc all the catholic ethnicities that was the primary purpose of prohibition so you can kind of see it as an anti-catholic act oh and actually during during world war one because there actually was a wartime prohibition for this i think maybe it had more to do with the fact that they needed the grain for the war effort but also, uh, part of that was fueled by an anti-German hysteria because a lot of the big uh, breweries that were around were run by Germans. Because, haha, stereotype, true and funny. Um, yeah, of all. yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so you know, uh, it might be a stereotype, but the Germans are still very, very good at their ancestral craft of beer making. We still are. Um, by the way, during the time of Prohibition, this is just a little offset, but I found out my great-great-grandfather was a bootlegger and brewed his own beer and sold it in his Napoleon, North Dakota. And then they, they would hide it as soon as the, um, uh, I forget which enforcement agency actually enforced Prohibition, but whenever they came around, they had a, they had a guy in the next town down warn them. Well, actually, Michigan... Uh... Michigan actually had a uh, prohibition uh, a year before it went national. And so, uh, and, and I will admit, I, I will acknowledge, okay, this is, this is a rare moment, people. I'm about to say something positive about Ohio. <sighs> Deep breath, calm. Uh, people from Ohio were running up uh, alcohol along the border. And uh, the Michi- I, I don't know if it was the state police, but I'm going to guess it was the state police. Uh, but there was, uh, but essentially they had to get the equivalent of a 1920s armored car. <laughs> and, uh, I don't even think it was like an actual armored car. I, it was years ago since I read the article, but I think it may have just been a regular civilian car that they slapped, you know, slabs of metal or p- pieces of metal on. Uh, so I don't, I mean... I mean, that's kind of an interesting historical tidbit, you know? I mean, regardless of prohibition, whether it's, you know, stupid or not, it's stupid. Uh, that That's kind of cool. The, the, the you know, Michigan, I'm going to guess it was the state police, got an armored car just to stop bootleggers from Ohio. It's yeah, so and... Longer than that to stop Ohioans. No armored <laughs> car will stop us. We cannot be contained. Well, the oh. rubber catching on fire might, but that was the seventies. Yeah. Um, also, when you when you try to enforce prohibition in German, Irish, Italian communities, it's just not going to work. I'm just telling you that right now. Nobody's going to want to enforce those laws. The sheriff is in on prohibition because he's also German, Irish, or Italian, and he's not going to want to stop drinking, etc. So. Honestly, those things to try to enforce mora- like very specific pieces of morality upon the general public through law, just it, it's a what's the best term for it? it but if there's Optimistic. no power, be- well, if if there's no power behind the law, there might as well not even be the law. And that's why, like in places like in North Dakota, Montana, w- Wyoming. Um, in various inner cities, it was just impossible to enforce prohibition. Yeah, I mean, it was... Prohibition led to the rise of the mafia, at least one of the 
very key drivers of the rise of mafia. Oh yeah, I almost, I almost forgot to mention the white Russians that were in America that also participated in bootlegging. Yeah, people don't know this, but after, um, uh, of course, the Russian Civil War, America took in tens of thousands of former white Russians, and they made up many of the Russian mafias that are so infamous in America today. And many of them are still even imperialists, <laughs> Russian imperialists. <laughs> and uh, one, one of my friends actually knew a Russian uh, mafia gang. It was somewhere in Virginia. And he went into one of the boss's houses, and they had the Russian imperial banner, he said, <laughs> over the dinner table. Man, Interesting. I, I, I really, I, I, you know, there's probably is, but I really should find a good book on, on like what the right Russians did after the war. Cause they, w I, I mean, I guess they just went, you know, well, I they, know went they went everywhere. Yeah, I know that like, uh, they, they, they were part of, uh, the concessions for a while. The, uh, you know, concessions of China essentially had their own, I guess, militarized police, uh, for the defense of the concessions. Uh, the Russians were part of that. There were some right Russians in the Japanese army for a hot minute, and then they all got shot uh, by the Japanese. Uh, we don't talk about that. Well, Anyways, well, uh, well, actually, the majority of them were handed over to the Soviets at the end of the at the end of the war. Um, uh, some of them, the more ideological ones, were shot by the Japanese, but that was like in the hundreds when the Soviets got their hands though on the Russian expat community and. Um, uh, Manchuria. Yeah, there were quite literal just slaughters on the tens of thousands. Although, given that, you know, Stalin wasn't exactly was uh, suspicious of uh, just regular Soviet civilians who were, uh, you know, forced labor, it, 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 it's not surprising that he would shoot uh, just shoot actual professed anti-communist on the spot. <sighs> yeah, several, several uh, white Russians initially emigrated to uh, Paris initially and the Anton nations, but come the 1920s when the uh, when the Cheka that became the NKVD started sending operatives into um, uh, European countries, they started hunting down white Russians. And the only place that became safe for most of the white Russians were in, at that time, Weimar, Germany, but under the chancellorship of Adolf Hitler before he fully abolished the Weimar Republic. So we're talking about like 1933. There's a large white Russian community in Berlin. But um, back to the whole thing Victor said about the rise of the mob, not to derail this lovely conversation about white Russian army survivors, but um, I remember what you said, Darth, about the Irish and Italian immigrants, and it's funny because that actually relates directly to the mob, that the majority of these early organized crime families originated in the Irish and Italian communities and in a way there were exact consequence of possible racial motivations that resulted in prohibition. So the lesson we should learn is don't be racist, don't be snobby, don't tell people they can't drink alcohol. Don't be they Protestant. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, actually, uh, another historical tidbit since we're talking about, you know, 30s and 40s of whatever Europe and World War II, um, it, the rise of the mob over here actually helped lead to the restoration of the mafia in Sicily because Mussolini spent uh, a good chunk of uh, you know effort on trying to root out mob control over Sic or the mafia's control over Sicily because, you know. Uh, yeah. People should be paying the taxes to the government and not to, you know, the crime families. Uh, but all fled to the Americas, but then Mussolini failed to solve the actual social economic problems that led to the mob. So when Mussolini fell, all the mafia members just went back to Sicily and southern Italy. Well, it was almost, it's worse. It was worse than that because we because while we were occupying the place, uh, we needed people to help us with the civilian government. And here were these handy groups of people who seemed to be very respected in the local community because they, when they said jump, the local populace asked how high. And uh, so we put them in charge. And also there was uh, the influence of, I can't remember his name, but there was an American mobster that we got, that we had in jail. And uh, he, and, uh, he essentially uh, leveraged his way 
into into being very influential and in how and in how Sicily would would go down uh, because I think he was threatening to get all the Italian dock workers to go on strike or or, or the at least the government thought that he had the power to do that. And of course, well, you're in the middle of a war. Your workers going on strike probably isn't a good idea. So you know, uh, the, the, he had a lot of leverage whilst at the same time sitting in a prison cell. <laughs> um, just just a little tidbit on that. Uh, most of the Italian mafia, the reason why they became a thing was because when Italy was forcefully unified under the Italian revolutions. Um, it ended up bringing in a northern Italian regime under the Savoys that became a constitutional monarchy, mostly controlled by the north over the south. And uh, with the dismantling of the uh, of the uh, two Sicilies, of two Sicilies um, uh, most of those mob members were uh, were faithful to the Bourbon family out in two Sicilies. What the? I'm outside, and a guy just drove by without a wheel on his front driver tire. What? Yeah, the least crazy driver. Any? Yeah, yeah. We okay. are okay. live, lady. When we do record this live, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, and that happened very much, very live. And that yes. was weird. <laughs> um, uh, we, should, we should do a live news report from uh, the Dakotas. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, anyway, pray uh, continue. But uh, yes, with the with the loyalty to the Bourbon dynasty and no loyalty to the Savoys, they the mob became the essential protectors, but also the enforcers of of the uh, secret laws that weren't actual paper laws, but were ones that were laws that were back in the time of the King of Two Sicilies that the people respected more than the Savoyan laws. Um. So, yeah, essentially the mob was the government in exile for the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, is what I'm trying to say. There's also a lot of social economic factors, and there is a truth that Southern Italy, especially after the Renaissance and everything, stayed much poorer than its northern neighbors, like in the city-states of Venice and Florence, Savoy and Milan. And that primarily was, and the funny part is that Southern Italy used to be the wealthier part of Italy, dating back to the Roman Empire. But after the Roman Empire collapsed, and definitely after the Islamic invasion of North Africa, Mediterranean trade was completely destroyed and disrupted, and this caused Southern Italy, that was very much dependent on commerce in the Mediterranean, to economically and socially fall behind its neighbors to the north that were much more attached to the Holy Roman Empire. And so the roots and everything that basically led to the mafia and to the issues that we were talking about goes all the way back to medieval times and the end of Rome and the direct con consequences of the fall of Rome. But I will say uh, that Southern Agrarian Italy is very cool. And uh, Kingdom of the Two Sicilies should totally become a thing again. And uh, if we could get Italy to, you know, where it was in maybe 1815, um, yeah, let's let's have a time. I mean, maybe an independent Venice. I don't know. It depends on how Austria looks like by the time Italy is where it should be. Uh, but yes, because of the, and actually, you know, people are like, oh, Ital Ital Italians, they obviously all belong together. Uh, the different Italian dialects were so thick that most Italians couldn't actually understand each other until TV became popular and a sort of unified dialect started to be um, spoken. And I guess there's a lot of areas in Italy where uh, it's it's that weird, like, vague line between a dialect and a separate language entirely. Um, Italian is very bad for this, like, especially... In I don't know if this gets touched on in The Godfather. I actually haven't seen The Godfather movies yet. But Sicilian, most Italians consider Sicilian distinctive of rest of mainland Italian due to them having entirely different words in their vocabulary. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, uh, I don't know, it's, 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 it's interesting to see how, you know, we, we, I mean, obviously I, I haven't studied Italy as perhaps as much as I ought. 
Uh, but I mean, it's I mean, it, the, the when you look at a map, you kind of assume a country is culturally homogenous unless you're you know told otherwise. But you know, southern Italy, you know. I mean, even even you know, in, at least in World War II, I'm not sure about now, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, all of Italy's industry, well, not all, but most of Italy's industry was in the north, and the south was still agrarian and rural, you know. Uh, and also, uh, surprisingly enough, it was the part of Italy I think that was uh, the hev- most heavily pro-monarchist in the totally not rigged uh, referendum on the monarchy that we totally had nothing, uh, no interference with whatsoever uh yeah it was yeah it was totally legit guys absolutely it was not rigged it was completely legitimate it's not like the very 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 pro-monarchist military weren't allowed to vote and because they weren't in italy at the time and they were intentionally sent away from italy to help with the reconstruction or how we intentionally favored the italian communist party after the war yeah, it, it, all that's irrelevant, guys. It was totally. It was. It, it, look, let's just say that um, the fair ideas of republicanism and and it it was all it it, it was it was it, it just won the intellectual battleground. It just in the free market of ideas. Ugh. Of course, there was. Mussolini did his own bit to trash the monarchy, primarily by making Emmanuel III his puppet, and then by slandering it while he was getting ready to be exiled and then beaten to a pulp. Well, yeah. actually... And then, uh, surprisingly, even when he was in exile and he stopped supporting the monarchy um, uh, towards the end of his life, he, for some reason, came back to Catholicism. I, it's kind of like a what moment? I mean, hey, uh, last minute. Com- I mean, hey. Uh, I mean, I know, mean, I. Well, I there was a there was a person that said that they saw a vision of him in uh, in purgatory. So. Yeah. Um, He's gonna have to spend a while there for all the crap he did. Well, well, well no, we shouldn't we, be necessarily we so for quick. him. Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't necessarily be so quick to judge. I mean, it is possible. Uh, that a person who lived a bad life their entire life uh, gets received into the church on their deathbed can get a plenary indulgence and all the temporal punishment uh, for sin would have been remitted. Although, if you're baptized at at, at your death, then all your uh, previous sins and the temporal punishments that would have been for them anyways go away. But anyway, that's beside the point. And, uh, And yeah. And I'm let's, getting that from reading the Denziger in different places, I think. Uh, let but, um, yeah, so we can, yeah. Or, or do we want to uh, discuss more of the philosophy of uh, government and the executive branch? Or uh, let's or move on to the let's move on to the philosophy thing. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, Will and Darth, you good with that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, just out of the blue philosophy, it's like, uh, th- that's such a broad stroke. Well, well, I well, I kind of had intended, and of course, this is the thing with the podcast, you can never actually, you know, your attentions always, mostly, t- most of the time fall apart. I had intended to, to sort of shift the topic, um, when we were talking about Biden and the executive order thing, to talk about how... Uh, in a monarchy, the rule of the executive and the judicial and the legislative are all put into this one person so the sort of conflict doesn't happen under a monarch where the monarch rules as well as reigns and uh, the different and the courts and everything and all those other things are under the monarch so there's always that unified vision uh, but then of course we got into a very interesting a very entertaining side discussion so I hope you enjoyed well I mean that this is my my gripe against constitutionalism is because it always tries to relegate the monarch at all, and it forgets his divine character because the monarch is appointed by God by the divine. He is placed in that lineage for a reason. That person who is going to be there, there's a reason why, um, and that's why whenever. A monarch emphasizes their divine right. You should actually listen 
and think about that because like you could have been born there as the prince and you would be monarch and that'd be your divine appoint your divine appointment um so then you get parliaments and uh Assemble attempting to usurp powers from the divinely appointed, and fundamentally, when you go against the monarch, you go against the king, and that's how. I mean, this is also gets into law. Um, uh, like back in the ancient times before law was secularized, there was the idea that uh that the law is fundamentally sacred because it's implemented by the sacred figure of the monarch. Um, and if you go against the law, you are going against the sanctity of the monarch. Um, and the sanctity of God, God or gods, um, uh, depending on which nation you're in. Um, that's why I fundamentally do not necessarily recognize on a spiritual level the lividity of, um, uh, secular laws made by assemblies and parliaments. I would recognize the law by a monarch because I know he is divinely appointed by God. And, I must show that respect not only to him, but to the divine. Um, so, yeah, that's how especially our ancestors viewed law, and that's why going against the king's peace was so... It, it was on paramount of her it was on the levels of heresy, and it was just not to be done. And, um... You know, this is all with the caveat that the king obviously couldn't decree whatever the heck he wanted. It's just that he, you know, he was supposed to always enforce the divine law and bring the secular law in accordance with, you know, striving for uh, bringing it to the divine, bringing, bringing humanity closer to the divine as opposed to us where we want to bring the law closer to whatever our ideal society is this minute. And then, you know, saying that's not progressive enough in 30 years and yeah, oh boy. i mean i mean that's just the damage of the enlightenment is it fundamentally was looking downwards to humanity instead of looking upwards to the divine and it stripped the divine nature from many of the thinking of many people's minds and uh that's why you have to always rationalize things in today's world like you didn't have to rationalize why the king why the king ruled by divine right he just did but now you you introduce that un that uncertainty into the plebeian's mind because he's not meant to think about such higher things, and yeah, that's just the easiest way to manipulate the masses, um, to abandon the divine for the uh, for the secular and ultimately look downwards, look down to the look down to the earth instead of looking up to the divine. I mean, that's what, look at every single cathedral, look at every single church. You always see it looking upwards. Always, you always look up to the divine. You don't look down to the earth. And, um, I mean, that that's really the real crux of the issue there. Um, because people, you know, will say, you know, it wasn't perfect in the past. And of course, I know it wasn't perfect in the past. But fundamentally, where, huh? It's it's such a stupid argument. Sometimes it's not perfect in the past. It ain't gonna be perfect in the future. It's never gonna be perfect. Yeah. Don't a perfect government because all governments temporal. They're constructs of man. And I mean, and I I will say that about uh, parliaments, assemblies, and all that such, and the actual institutions, but. The idea of the of the state, I mean, the idea of the state has pretty much usurped the idea of God, um, uh, and it, you can kind of see it as something divine, at least in the secular mind. That's why uh, you see politicians, especially in America today, spout out our sacred democracy whenever uh, people decide to walk the red velvet in um, uh, Capitol Hill. Um, I'm not going to refer to the event just because I don't trust Susan, but it, God has been fundamentally usurped from the common man and replaced with the the idea of the state. And it is a divine state. It is a fundamentally degraded, de deplorable state run by the demos, run by run by the lowest caste of all the castes, and. Uh, 
That's why it is fundamentally evil. And you know, it. I mean, and this is this is why you know people may call us idealists for wanting to go back to the Middle Ages. But the thing with the Middle Ages was they worked. I mean, not everybody was living in high, you know, was living with AC or whatnot. But fundamentally, uh, in fact, no, in fact, no one was not even the king. Well, yeah, but but I mean, fund fundamentally, um, there there were of course wars in Europe. I'm not going to say that it was all quiet, but until the Hundred Years' War, there wasn't really any major conflict between you know two two kingdoms because everybody generally was speaking on the same page and then of course you have a certain little re protestant revolt and then of course you get all that all that all those wars and then the 30 years war and then of course everybody just decides to uh stop treating religion as the most important thing and it all comes down to and all wars are fought over trade rights anyways in the 1700s and then of course you get to the 1800s and the 1900s and well, yeah. Thanks, Luther. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the Protestant Reformation or Revolution, whichever term you prefer to use, was the implementing of that, uh, of that seed of doubt. It was that seed, it was that seed because if you doubt the church, which is on top, the one that is guided by the Holy Spirit in its decisions and in its um uh, and in its liturgy, then you introduce the doubt of well, why why does the king rule? Why shouldn't I rule? Why does he get to rule by divine right? Don't I have a divine mandate? Because am I not the interpreter of God? Um, and then it devolves from there. Um, uh, which typically like the one asking that question of the king is the aristocrat or the merchant. And then you get the third estate, um, uh, the mer the merchants who are like, okay, well, we want the say because we own such and such. We we bring in all the money. Let's just cut out God from the middle. Fundamentally, the Enlightenment period. Um, and then you get to the um uh, fourth estate, which is the Marxian state, where it is ruled by the um uh, proletariat. And you get the demos to fully take command of the nation themselves and usurp it from the third estate. That's why they go on about the bourgeoisie, but they say that capitalism was a necessary step um, uh, from feudalism to capitalism and then from capitalism to communism. And Marx said you had to go through all these stages because you had to go from the you had to go from the first estate, which is um, a monarch to the second estate, which is the aristocracy, to the third estate, which is the bourgeoisie, and to the fourth estate, which I don't necessarily say he's wrong in that case, because that is fundamentally the trend that we've seen throughout many nations' courses, and aka like the, uh, during the Cold War, the American, pa America and the Western powers were fundamentally the bourgeois states run by bourgeoisie classes, and they were always teetering on the break of a revolt of the fourth estate. So you, you can always, you can date it back to that um, uh, Luther guy going out about heresy, and it led to the rise of communism. I mean, uh, yeah, this is, I mean, obviously, uh, and this is this is something I know. This isn't necessarily a religious podcast, but who are we kidding? It totally is. Uh, <laughs> but I, I I brought this up, and uh, I I think I may have only brought it up two or three times. But I, I never heard necessarily a Protestant answer to why that isn't the case, and I, I'd like to know what they think. You know, I mean, because um, can can you repeat will... the uh? Well, I mean, well, that the whole you know Luther made it so you can question the Bible and the Church and this that and, and then of course you know that's the highest thing that I've absolutely under no circumstances should be questioned and then of course it all devolved from there and you know devolved to the you know monarchy and then to the family which you know nowadays the family concept is dead. I mean even in more traditional families, I mean even the nuclear family that's that's sort of a, that's sort of a devolution 
of uh, where where we where we used to be because I mean the idea of just the nuclear family as one mother one father and then the children in a self contained unit isn't exactly where we were because you used to have the aunts and the uncles and the grandmother and the grandparents and all that in in a family governing structure where you know the grandparents would still have authority over their children even after their children moved out and became parents of their own. Uh, of course, that's gone nowadays but and even yeah. and even new nu- and even the nuclear family is falling apart yeah so i mean even the, that nuclear that that good old nuclear family that you know people like me used to really you know you know think was the bee's knees back when i was in my the 50s was totally the best guys uh stage so before before you realize that's really a degradation of the family that it is yeah a, a a dysgenic form of what we used to have. Um, uh, I mean, everything you see today is a dysgenic form of what we used to have. Um, uh, the monarchy was the true. The monarchy was the truly highest form that we could have, and we just degraded this far. I mean, this is why, like, if you play, if you read Plato's Republic, he always puts the monarchy as the first form of government. It always comes first. It is the truest to human nature. And then you get the oligarchy, which is like the mer- the merchants. They usurp the king and they take the power for themselves. Then you get the demos, and the demos or the people, they usurp the oligarchy and then they steal power for themselves. And it become it's the most anar it's one of the most anarchistic ages. Um, uh, and then you get the tyranny out of the demos, which typically most tyrannies have come out of demos based societies. Whether it's a dictatorship of the proletariat, which you saw over several communist regimes, or Adolf Hitler or Mussolini, it's also another great example of the rule of the demos um, uh, turning into a tyrant, um, a tyranny. So, and I would I would argue today that today is also in the we're transitioning from the demos to the to the tyrannical age. It's gonna be fun. Not really. Yeah. It's not gonna be fun at all. But well, well um, I mean, it, it. Remember, things go in cycles. Like Plato said, that typically, like after a tyranny, you would see the natural order come back in in a monarchy. So it, it's typically like everything else. Life goes in stages. Um, governments go in stages. Regimes, whatever you want to call them. Although I will say, moving down from our uh, lofty philosophical heights for a second, the thought of Joe Biden in like a third world dictatorship uh, uniform with the sunglasses and everything—I don't know. I, I put up with it for five seconds and then get tired of it. <laughs> I mean. Seems like- be a comedy sketch, to be perfectly honest. Like, it seems like something that should be out of, like, a Monty Python movie or, like, Baseballs or something. The idea of that scrawny old man in, like, a military uniform. Hey, Jack, um, uh, you got a license to uh, walk on the street there. It's uh, past curfew. We got to get to bed, Jack. I mean, like, if you hear some of the stories that come out of tyrannies, it does sound like a Monty Python sketch. Like uh, how in Stalin's Soviet Union, he would execute the executioners after a while once, and he would make the claim that they had too much revolutionary zeal. And you would then you would see, like, a say the Jewish executioners be replaced by Russian executioners, and then he'd replace the Russian executioners with Polish executioners, etc. And it, it's almost all forms of government, like if you boil it down and like look back in retrospect, yeah, you can kind of see it as like a Monty Python sketch. But, I mean, comedy is one of the major, is one of the two forms of uh, entertainment, but Either you have either comedy or tragedy, and uh, both of them speak truths about our reality. 
just in different me just in different uh subtext. I think um back to the whole returning to natural order, I recently watched a video about wig history and something that stuck out to me because it was almost exactly like the history of the US was the history of the Serene Republic of Venice and how the wealthy merchant class basically became over a period of generations an established oligarchy of new aristocrats or basically they bought themselves their power and then they made it impossible for anyone else to become wealthy or prosper in order to secure their own power and that really struck home with me because it seemed to be exactly what happens and what is happening in the U.S. now. We have well, an increasingly powerful and wealthy oligarchy of many people who have made their wealth in their own lifetimes. And they're increasingly dominating the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, the Rothschild, I forget which Rothschild specifically said this, but it was one of them, said, um, uh, give me control of the money supply. I don't care who runs the nations because I make the laws. I, I'm paraphrasing it, of course, because I don't remember the exact verbatim, but it was, if you take control of the money supply in any nation, like you privatize the money supply and then you put it into the hands of private interests, you you control the nation then. It's not, the, it's not these national governments. It's not these, uh, not these, interest groups not the not the people voting at the polls it is whoever controls the money supply and that's because they can direct capital wherever they want that's why america has persistently attempted to keep the usd um uh, the world reserve currency the pet and all all types of trades all exchanges all uh, all oil purchases because you have to keep America as the middleman. And if you can cut out the middleman, suddenly take away America's power. Because America did this on a mass, mass scale, even though America itself doesn't even own its own money supply. I mean, you could kind of say the person that, the people that do own the money supply do guide the national policy, which is very true. When I mean, the person says that, that money makes the world go around. They are not wrong. They have a very intuitive, actually, even if most people don't know how to articulate it and know where to look. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It is a very. I don't know, because on paper, you know, everything appears to be all. Uh, whatever you know, you have a U.S. mint and whatnot, but then you realize the Federal Reserve is sort of—I don't know. I'm I'm kind of sick and tired of a bunch of people dictating how uh, our economic policy uh, works, and I think that I, I guess you know, ultra distributism break up all the large large corporations and put them in the hands of private families and and you know and, and local communities. I'm sick and tired. Of having to go to Myers as my local store when it's a giant Midwestern chain, and yet it's still somehow more yes. local than Walmart, just be by virtue of the fact Walmart's across the entire country. <sighs> well, I mean, like, uh, just look at Christ as the greatest example of this. Like, uh, financial interests right. took over, uh, took over the kingdom of Judea far, far before the birth of Christ. And they had infiltrated all levels of society using finance to dictate life. And when Christ um, uh, came upon this in the uh, in the actual temple in Jerusalem, where the financiers have had set up their tentacles inside the inside the uh, ancient temple, he whipped them out. You you whip the money changers. You take you seize their assets. You take and you. Don't allow them to manipulate your people through uh, through finance, which is one of the easiest way to control people if you can control their finances. You start yeah, to see, you start to see very quickly why 
most early Christians considered banking to be a sin. Well, it it, it, it well usury is a sin, and, and the bank is supposed to be subservient to whichever crown they are under. So uh, yeah, and I mean, you know, as soon as you start having anything for anything's sake, um, there's a problem. Um, you know, because because ultimately, even even our side interests, our side hobbies, our our jobs, um, everything should ultimately be for the greater glory of God, right? And um, I don't know if this is really getting all preachy, and I technically don't have a license to preach because I'm just a layman, but um, but you know, everything should be properly speaking. Uh, oriented towards god and your salvation uh you know you know when this is why you know, blessed emperor carl married zeta he said you know now we have to help each other get to heaven because that's what spouses are supposed to do they're supposed to get themselves help help get each other to heaven um but you know if, when you get money for money's sake or you get well anything for anything's sake and i had to remind myself of this really because um you know, I I have this unfortunate tendency to bounce back and forth between a few hobbies and get hyper fixated on that hobby for a while and then go to the next one. And I really need to stop and consider myself which what? hobby, if any, is going to actually help me be a better what? person. Okay, I'm. I mean, like hobbies in themselves is actually very natural for the man to have. I'm a, well, no, I'm saying hobbies man... are bad. I'm just saying that I have a problem. <laughs> Well, I, I'm I'm also saying that, like, good hobbies, of course, enforce good good natures, and uh, it is natural for a man to have a very specific niche hobby. Like we've seen this all throughout um uh, human history, whether it's like building uh building ships and bottles, um uh, writing poetry, even if it's not necessarily your job, it is perfectly fine for me to have these things like i have several hobbies whether it's studying high politics philosophy um uh um uh writing a book series to uh hopefully intentionally use that to honor god but even like basic arts and stuff like these things are all can all be glorious in their own way like uh a uh at least a person in their trade, like, even in their own job, if they make it a sacrament for themselves to honor God, it it, it takes on that divine nature that previously it didn't have. Um, so, crux of the story, everything, you should still be looking upwards, even in your most menial tasks. Thank you. That is probably a good point to sort of use as a conclusion to this sort of topic, which which was a really informative discussion, I must say. Let's sort of, if anybody has any final thoughts on this before we move on to our other foreign relations topic um i guess i would just say if you're like me and can't pick a hobby which whichever specific one you want uh i don't know see see which one is maybe gonna help you develop more more skills uh in general i i guess because and that's from somebody who just now thinks he knows what he wants to you know have his permanent hobby be but anyways uh, i guess that's my final uh quip uh will you have any any final uh things on i guess everything we've been saying since 10 minutes into this podcast <laughs> i think we're good i think we've hit the nail on the head um, and beat it into the wood yeah, a couple more times. I've been saving my arguments for our next topic. Oh, yes. Uh, Darth, do you have a final? 
Um, I am good to move on. All, All right. right. Thank you very much. Uh, U.S. born, the U.S. born Prime Minister of Great Britain, Boris Johnson, has officially resigned his post following a slew of resignations from the Tory party of Great Britain uh, due to the revelation of several, I believe, scandals involving Mr. Johnson, most specifically uh, his wife hosting a party at 10 Downing Street during lockdown. Oh, we all know that's not the reason why. We all know that that's just a <laughs> scapegoat for the for the globalists, for the uh, international well, capitalists to get them out. Like they they point to all these like little tiny reasons that wouldn't get even a low level politician fired. Well, not not you can't technically fire a politician, or you know what I mean. It won't make them resign. These are small trifle little things that just get brushed under the rug all the time everywhere else. They just decide to drag out drag out these skeletons before people dangling them up on all on all places in media, even though they're people fundamentally do not care. Nobody cared that he had a party. Well maybe like the small minority of people that actually do care. But that's subsequently very minor and unimportant amount of the population. Um, uh, essentially, I'm saying the plebeians at large did not care. Boris Johnson did those parties. He did not care that uh, he covered up for one of his allies because they all kind of knew Johnson was a sleazy guy. I mean, I, I get this all by watching British, like British media that's not the mainstream over there. Like, uh, I, I know this is kind of cringe, but I still listen, I still watch Sargon, just for at least the British perspective on these things. Um, also, Academic Agent is, um, uh, he did a podcast the other day about this, and, I mean, fundamentally, his synopsis is just, they dragged out these skeletons, dangled them up for about a month, trying to put on the pressure on Johnson to get him to resign, and after a failed uh, vote of no confidence, that was actually pretty close. It was like one of the closest votes that ever happened um, uh, in the Tory party's history. Um, and then they start signaling that they're going to resign, and then they resign en masse. But even after they resigned en masse, Boris Johnson said, no, I'm going to carry on. I don't, I don't care. I'm trying to... I'm forgetting exactly what he wore, but I think he threw bloody in there somewhere um, on typical British fashion. But he said he didn't care. He's going to carry on. And sometimes between when he said that, which was only a few hours before his resignation, um, something must have happened. The, they must have gone to him and threatened him or something to make him resign. Yeah, I mean... In on the whole party thing. I get why some people were upset because the British lockdowns were far more extensive and far more severe than anything we saw stateside. But at the same time, it wouldn't have been something I would have considered res making Boris Johnson resign over. Absolutely not. Well, but well, like um, I said, there, there's skeletons that they dragged out dangled in front of the media, which, by the way, the British media does not represent the opinion of the actual British people. Same with the media in the United States. It fundamentally does not matter because they are controlled by tools of finance at higher levels by people who hate um, uh, the British people who hate, well, frankly, all European peoples and have absolute contempt for them. Um and Boris Johnson, you know, he was going along with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these internationalist measures. Like uh, when he did breakfast, breakfast, <laughs> Bre Brexit. Brexit. Um, uh, he, yeah, his his reasoning for 
supporting Brexit was, oh, we're going to those awful Europeans, and we're going to embrace the rest of the world, guys. Yes, we're just going to open up Britain to the rest of the world now that we're free from those Europeans. Um, that That's literally, like, his justification for supporting Brexit. It He wanted to open Britain up to the other parts of the world that were not Europe. That apparently Europe was restricting, even though there's no evidence to that. It was just pretty much a campaign ploy. I mean, they were on the side of anti-globalists. He was always in the pocket, but he had too much of a personality, so they... And something that I unfortunately, you know, learned recently, uh, he apparently is pro-choice, and he called uh, overturning Roe v. Wade a massive step backwards. So, you know, when that's the leader of the conservatives saying that, you, you know, Britain's in a right old state, but that's more of a side issue. But, um, anyway, I gonna, what I was, I forget what I was going to say. Oh, my big thing about this whole chaotic mess, and for those of you who don't know, I'm the person that runs the Twitter account, and I've made a statement on Twitter on behalf of Moa, but this is a wonderful, wonderful example of a time the Queen could have stepped in and brought order to Parliament, but the Queen isn't allowed to do such. Um, I mean, duh, it's a, it's another Machiavellian power. Like, ever since Cromwell, they, they have made sure that the monarch, like, they'll make it in theory they could do these things, but in reality... It's never going to happen again. It just... There's never going... At least until there's a full collapse in the system. A full restructuring. Probably around the monarch. In in that case. Unless Britain just devolved into... Uh, um, uh, unless Britain just fully devolved into anarchy. Then... I mean, the Queen... The monarchy in Britain is never going to be able to reassert itself as long as it has the parliament there, as long as it has the banks there, as long as it has these financial interests there. It's never going to happen. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, oh, sorry, oh, go, go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, and, and England. And well, Britain, it just hurts for me um, because, you know, I used to be my first, I guess, step outside of the America great. Yeah, thing was, um, you know, Britain, you know, and, and seeing in some ways, you know, Britain kind of helped me get into monarchism as a concept, uh, you know, and the ideas of the empire and all that, uh, because, you know. In terms of the visuals, how it looked in the eighteen in the late eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds, you know, the Edwardian period and the Victorian age and all that. Britain looked very uh, on the outside, you know, just looking at it in still photos. Well, not in the dingy parts of London, but I mean, you, you know, in the countryside or whatever. It looked like all you know, it looks like all as well. Um, in fact, the model waddling fake model railroad thing i want to do and want to do is actually of uh my is actually of a well a fictitious part of england that's catholic and jacobite still but um but but you know it's still in that same style of how things were in like the 1920s or 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 before that um but it wasn't and it kind of it's sort of painful for me because you know britain was sort of my first lens outside of what it was outside of just this, I guess, purely America, American worldview. And I realized that, you know, it, it hasn't been exactly all that. And then I realized that, you know, that Victorian England, how much better would it have been, you know, had Henry VIII not done the thing and that old England where the sun where, you know, it was an endless spring and the sun uh, was never obscured in the sky. 
was taken from us. Of course, obviously, not literally, of course, it was still raining in England. All the, but but you, you know what I'm saying. Um, you mean there was a time period where England wasn't a rainy, depressing place? I mean, probably. Apparently, appar- uh, if if uh, if science, if modern science is is true, the area that is now the Sahara used to be a uh, uh, used to be like a wetland where it was, you know, I mean, a very shallow the, water. The Sahara start. The Sahara is starting to green again because of the increased amounts of CO two in the atmosphere. Yeah, um, or- CO two is actually really good for desert. Oh, he he just dropped off. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't know if I mean, I I guess there's probably a time when England wasn't as rainy as it is now. But um, actually, though, I do like I do like dreary. I, I do like dreary. You know, um, I, I mean, like when it's when it's drizzling and it's all gray out. I like that aesthetic. I mean, I'm not saying I want to live in it all the time, but you know. All I gotta I say. Find that is, I find that aesthetic a little depressing. Uh, but, uh, well, I don't know. Imagine you're in an English, you know, uh, an English town, probably Catholic, of course, and uh, the, you know, you, you're in the, you see the clouds rolling over the hills. I don't know. I, I like it. And there's all the sheep, and they're all fluffy. You know, it's it's just nice. All I gotta say is. There's a reason that Britain colonized so much of the world, and that is because everyone wanted to leave it. Oh yeah, and actually, that, that I and I and I know you know uh, maybe I don't think you know probably we've hit our daily allowance of Protestant bashing, but uh, uh, very few people from Spain left. You uh-huh. know that's why uh, uh, you know well weekly allowance of Protestant bashing. Very few people from Spain left, and after. Um, that sort of like truce between the Catholics and the Protestants was broken in the 1700s. Uh, not that many people left France, uh, which is why the Quebecois actually come from a very uh, smaller uh, population size, uh, and then then say we, then say the Anglo's that are here do, uh, and then but you know England, oh boy, they couldn't wait to leave. Come from a small. Uh, well, it helps if you were offered a lot of money, because yeah. nobody wanted to move to Quebec because Quebec is a frozen wasteland that just has sparse forests. There is nothing in Quebec to move to. Where you do realize that that that's that's basically the Midwest, except slightly warmer a quarter of the year. Yes, but you can actually grow things in the Midwest. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, there was the fur trading industry. I mean, Quebec. I don't know. I like Quebec. It was it was the last best hope of North American kind until the seventies, until the Quiet Revolution happened. But um, no um, the main thing and the main reason why the English colonies were so successful is because the English colonial strategy appealed to um economic mobility and the upper lower class and the middle class because it provided them with a luxury that had become scarce in England and that being the being land that could be owned. The opportunity to own your own land was a major financial incentive that the English brought and people ate it up. In Spain, the end coming in and the system they employed there was basically a transplant of feudalism. And in France, most of the land was still owned by the French fur trading company, although a lot of the Quebecois, especially the Contre des Bois, being the French woodsmen, lived in the woods on their own land. There wasn't a lot of economic opportunity in Quebec. The English were so successful in colonizing because they knew how to provide the proper economic incentives. Until, you know, they decided to use the U.S. as an ATM, and that's when we told them, get lost. Well, we weren't... I mean, we, we weren't their ATM, but, I mean, when when you're the one colony that wasn't completely ravaged by the Seven Years' War, it kind of which, the bill for all the war debt. Which we started. To be fair to Britain, we're the one that picked that fight. 
and and actually those taxes yeah. that 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 are commonly uh said to to have been for um shoot when you're the when you're when those taxes are the were uh we, we like to think that those taxes were to pay britain's debt for the war they weren't those taxes were actually just to pay for the upkeep of the regulars that were there. Now, sure, we can argue whether or not those regulars were needed, given that you know Quebec was beaten. Uh, but but you know the government you know was talking about how you know we needed the regulars there to you know to keep peace with the Indians or whatever their justification was. But yeah, the taxes weren't to pay off the debt. The the, the British in Britain were still going to be paying off the debt for the war that we started, but. We were just they were they were just asking us to foot the bill for the troops defending us, which yeah, I mean, and- I'm not saying it's equivalent to a police department, because, but, you know, I mean, the police in your own city, if you if you had to contract in police to uh, get your own city, I don't see why the people who live in that city shouldn't have to foot the bill for that. But And the funny part is. um and the funny part is, the Baltimore City Police Department is made up of people who live outside of the technical boundaries of Baltimore City. You know, there really should be a requirement. If you want to be in a city's police department, you have to be a resident of said city. I mean, that that's nice in theory, but, I mean, some cities probably wouldn't, would, probably wouldn't uh, have any available manpower to draw on, and I don't think that a police draft is... Uh... Is, is going to go down particularly well. Uh, that's fair, but anyway, and the funny part is is that the Indians and the French Canadians had no interest in causing problems. The French Can- the British, when they took French Canada, provided much needed traffic and opened a lot of trade opportunities that basically didn't exist under French rule. Not to mention they protected their rights to practice Catholicism and the Native Americans like the British because the British were very, very keen on guaranteeing the rights to their land and sovereignty. Those two, well, particularly the Native Americans, didn't start becoming hostile again until the Revolutionary War because they knew the colonial government and the people that were leading the revolution had no intention and protecting or even respecting their land rights. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's interesting because the Indian tribes, this is why we call it the French and Indian War, not the but whatever. Most of the Indian tribes had it with the French because the French were, because uh, here was the French menta- here was the French and the Spanish mentality. If you were Catholic uh, and you supported and, and you acknowledged the king, then you were French. I mean, that was, and obviously, you know, if you were in a Spanish colony and you were Catholic and you supported the uh, the the Spanish king, then you were Spanish. You know, it was just it was just that simple. Um, and then it was only really it was only after uh, we get into like the 1700s or you know stuff like that and all these sciency whatever, so we get this sort of scientific racism. Um, but the French, so so for that you know thing, even though there wasn't a lot of what we would call traditional Quebecois. Uh, a lot of, in, in the eyes of many Frenchmen, it would, I mean, there was a lot more Frenchmen there than we would have seen. It's just that they didn't look like Frenchmen. I mean, because, I mean, hey, they're they're Catholic, and they uh, they like uh, King Louis, whichever one it is at the time. Eh, they're French. You know? Um, they just, they just, uh, they just speak a little different, and uh, they, they like to move around a bit. They like to see the world. They like to travel. They like to. They would. They would. <laughs> Although, okay, okay, okay. Side tangent. If the Indians weren't, you know, whatever, enforced onto reservations, like the nomadic Indians, do you think that they would? How how do you think they would have responded to the to the possibility of like, um, I don't know, giant flatbreads to just move their houses around, like the wigwams. I think, I don't know exactly. I think it might have made more sense once we invented RVs and everything. And that perhaps they could have had a similar, um, like, semi-nomadic culture similar to what the Romani are in Europe. But 
I don't know exactly. Of course, things would get difficult once so much of the land became farmland and when we basically exterminated the buffalo for sport and because nobody ever happened to think of the idea instead of, hey, you know, hunting the buffalo to extinction, why don't we try and farm raise the buffalo? And it was just, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things the U.S. could have done differently that we didn't do simply because we didn't want to bother with actually treating Native Americans as if they were human beings. Is yeah. Respect and decency. I, I mean, there was an attempt at, at some points. Like, there was a, uh, I can't remember which tribe, but I think it was one of the ones maybe in New York or whatever where the French were. And they still, this tribe was still Catholic. And surprisingly, in a rare display of uh, exception, I guess exceptions proving the rule, I guess, I don't know. Um, uh, they they gave $100 so that they could build a parish or something. And of course, you know, this is back when $100 <laughs> could, who could actually be considered a substantial well, contribution to to a building project. So, you know, there was an attempt. Didn't go great, but there was an attempt. <sighs> uh, so... I, uh, well, to go back to the whole Boris Johnson thing, and this is something that baffles me, something that amazes me. Now, granted, a British PM serves for five years while a U.S. congressman serves for two, but it amazes me that at no point in American history, we ever, we didn't ever come up with the idea it's like, Hey, votes of no confidence should be a thing that we should be able to, if government is considered inept, throw Congress out. You're kind of cutting out a lot. Yeah. Um, so the the I idea of the vote the vote of no confidence is an internal party party thing. Um, uh, most well, I mean, you can bring it before the parliament itself, but it was brought before the Tory party itself not the parliament um and they had the vote internally as a party to remove boris johnson as the party leader and by effect if it's the party leader that is made the prime minister of the leading party um and that's why he would have been removed there but that didn't happen so per se the democrat party voted to boot nancy pelosi out of speaker of the house but but she's not chief executive though like she's just she's just the speaker for the parliament like the speaker like england has a speaker as well and the speaker is a permanent seat that does not change um oh. it just is the one that that adjourns calls forth parliament and brings forth legislation um, I mean, in the U.S., it's kind of like more elevated because also like the third um, uh, inheritor to the American throne in case something was to happen um, to the uh, two usurpers that are above it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, if, I, I don't think that it would go down particularly well. Well, actually, there is sort of a vote of no confidence type thing. It's called uh, impeachment and a, conviction of a president. And the Speaker of the House of Commons is nonpartisan. Yes, That's the I, difference. I, know, I know that one. The Speaker's seat is nonpartisan, but they essentially serve the same function because uh, you can say that the Speaker's seat in England is nonpartisan, but the person itself that is a Speaker can very much be partisan. That always happens. Um, yeah, well. it's it's interesting because in my town, uh, technically, our our city elections are nonpartisan. But come on, they're all Democrats. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that yeah. Um, yeah. It, every every politician who's ever elected is partisan, even if they don't have a little party behind their name. Yeah, I mean, but 
at the end of the day, in the bipartisan system, it's whoever has the majority in Congress that picks the speaker anyway. So it is. It, it is like the prime is like the prime minister in that way. Yeah. You know, we we should just change the House Speaker's name to the Prime Minister of America. Let's go go full hog. Yeah, so wait a second, wait a second. Question. So does the Prime Minister actually have to be a holder of a seat in Parliament yes. or Yes. Yes. Okay. He he so has actually... to be an Yes, the, the head of the party runs in his own district. He has to win his own district to remain head of the party and become prime minister. That's how parliamentary systems work. Unless you're there's some systems where you can be head of the party. Um it mostly depends on the on the party specifically where you can be head of the party without being a MP in government. Famously Adolf Hitler did that where he was head of the NSDAP, but he was never in the Reichstag as an MP. And that's of course, we could also, I believe, point out that the that there comes a time where if you're in one of the British election districts, I don't know what they call them over there, but you might like the local polit the local politician for one of the parties. But if you vote for that particular politician, that means that you're giving a vote to some other dude who is going to be the prime minister if their party gains power, and you might not like that prime minister. Yeah. So I mean, in a way, a vote for your local MP is also a vote for that party's prime minister. Whereas over what? here, a vote for your local congressman is not the same thing as a vote for the president. Although, yeah. generally speaking, most people will just put, you know, straight R or straight, you know, well, yeah, I mean, that's, you're you're going, you have that in England, too, like, the entire English-speaking world has this trope of people just voting by tribe, like, they don't really care what the party actually stands for, they just vote because their father votes that way, because their grandfather voted that way, like, there's intergenerational labor voters, there's mostly in the north of England, then there's intergenerational Tory voters, mostly in the south of England and Wales. Um, I mean, labor also has a big presence in Wales as well. Um, that That's just because you, over there, you vote based on tribe. In America, it's very much the same thing. Oh, yeah, I was raised in a Republican household. I'm probably going to vote Republican because there's an illusion of choice. Um, just like in England, there's an illusion of choice. Um, I, I like in on the European continent, at least they're a bit more open with their parliamentary system. They don't just gatekeep it to two parties. They actually allow other parties to come to the debate stage. The, America has that same problem. The, the English-speaking world in general has that problem. Canada, not to the same extent. They actually allow other parties um, uh, to go, like they have a... Uh, the head of the, the head of each party has a debate um, uh, all at the same time. In the UK, it's typically just between the Tories and Labour. I don't in one where there's been more parties than that. Um, in the German-speaking world, they do the exact same thing, where they have like twenty different party leaders um, uh, at the same debate. But in America, yeah, it's always a debate between just two people. Um, nobody else is allowed because ma, ma reasons, which literally, like, there are laws saying that only the Republicans and Democrats have the franchise to hold to hold these debates. Other parties have to do it privately and do it by their own private funds. Uh, I I love democracy. It's it's so the I don't I, I mean. 
I don't know. I mean, it's 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 sort of impressive how we can how we can try all these different things and eventually get to the same two choice thing. It's just a matter of how you're going to do it because, like, you know, whether it's first past the post or 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 whatnot. Uh, but I do like the idea of 150 different. There's there's what 400 and 35 seats in in the uh, House of Representatives. I do like the idea of 435 different individual parties represented by one person throwing it down into debate, though. Now that I would I would like to see. I don't know um, how you can have 435 I mean, unique positions on an issue, I, but I would. I mean, honestly, I would say like on the state level, especially if you have multiple seats. I say it's like proportional voting. I know places like California would never do that because then the Democrats would lose seats. Um, uh, and then there wouldn't necessarily be districts and everybody would just vote for a party there. And they'd be divided by percentage. Or you can just go on the full like national stage and like everybody votes for for Congress and uh, it's all proportional. And then you could actually get some more parties in there, like uh, vote for the uh, Communist oh, Party. Oh. Well, will Alaska just will Alaska just started ranked choice voting? Well, that's not the same thing. This is the same thing. And New York oh. City did rank choice, but I mean, I don't know. I, I I know this isn't a discussion on voting systems, but I don't I don't really like proportional voting as a concept because I still like the idea of local representation and the fact that on the national level, I'm being represented by you know a senator from Michigan. Or uh, on the state level, a uh, representative from the county of blank or I mean, the city of you, blank. Here, here's here's a here's an example of a combination of both proportional and local. The German Bundestag, which is like the the only tacit parliament, like I can quasi tolerate, but I still know that it's controlled by the American State Department, and they only allow certain parties to actually run. Um, uh, because certain parties are too dangerous in Germany to be allowed to run, at least by American standards. I do um, like the Bundestag uh, is elected. I've in the um when we were discussing things in the committee, I've brought that idea up before that Congress should be elected in such a manner. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, where, where you vote, you vote for a local representative on one side of the ballot, and then on the other side of the ballot, you vote for a party, and then uh, your Whoever wins the local seat wins the local seat. So typically, that that's a first past the post on the local seat. But then they they tally up the percentages of votes that each party gets on the other side of the ballot, and then they balance out the seats with more members of for each party to represent its true proportion. Well, kind of its true proportion of the vote. But you have like this mixture of local representatives and just. Um, uh, appointments from the party into the parliament itself. Uh, okay. Um, How am I becoming the most base prophet, Leon? I, I, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, you, you ever notice? You ever like had those moments where there's something like stupidly obvious that's staring you in the face for so long, and you only just realize it? Like the fact that Little Sle uh, Caesar's logo is is Caesar with the pizza. Um, I just had one of those moments. I just realized what first passed the post, you know, the first to pass the post of X amount of percent of the vote. I, it took me how many years <laughs> to realize that from first watching those CGP Grey videos? Um, well, if you, well, well, if you live in a state without a strong horse racing tradition, you won't know what that means. Well, Unlike I, people who live in Maryland or Kentucky. All right, tout your sudden superiority. Well, actually, it's Kentucky, Kentucky isn't sudden, is it? It's like yeah. it's like Southern light. Yes, yeah, Southern light. <laughs> I have no dog in this game. I don't live anywhere near this dispute. Um, I don't know. But uh, I, anyway, I, don't know. I I'm think just it's... I'm just in favor of more proportional representation because then it allows for more parties instead of just this gridlocked um uh, red versus blue, which really both they're the same party, just uh with different faces and slightly different talking points. It's more of a difference of policy instead of a difference of goal. 
And that's why I hate fundamentally both parties. With a more proportional representation system, you can allow for parties that are radically different from each other and have radically different views and represent the fringes of society. Like, uh, the truly, like, 10% of people who are socialist in America can finally have the representation in Parliament. They can finally stop having to go to the Democrat Party, and the Democrat Party can get rid of those people and siphon them off to a new party. Same with the Republicans. They get rid of their more nationalist crowd into their own party. And, and they can Catholic go back Catholic Solidarity to... will finally get a seat. Oh, sorry. And, and, a, and a Catholic Falangist party in America. <sighs> I mean, I don't know. Part of me is willing to try it, but at the same time, I don't know. Anyways, so... Yes, Monarch. Um, I think it's, could I think... have a, we could finally have a seat. American monarchist car party can be a reality, and supposedly by polls, five percent of Americans are monarchist. So, <laughs> we could have five percent in Congress. Correction: five percent of American people are sympathetic to it. Well, yeah, but imagine if there's like a monarchist party actually on the ballot, and it was an option to vote for. I, and if you got five, if you theoretically got all that five percent to vote for the monarchist party, <laughs> yeah, you'd have five percent of the seats then. And then, th and then maybe somebody would force us into the uh, would would invite us into the coalition government, and we could uh, we probably wouldn't get much done in our first uh, first uh, session, but we we would we would get the anti nobility laws repealed, so people could start calling themselves by their. You know, I, titles that they had to, you know, lose when they I, got over here. I can that, finally bring back my title of Freiherr from from the old from old Bavaria. But uh, I mean, Poland, like currently, they they have a coalition between the Law and Justice Party and the Monarchist. It, it's it's weird. Like it's a monarcho libertarian party. It's funny, but yeah. I mean. I, I wouldn't want to form a coalition with the libertarians, but if that's what it takes, <laughs> no, well, no, I, they're, I they're monarcho libertarians. Like they're libertarians that support a monarchist government in Poland. <laughs> Are they like at least Catholic libertarians? I, how do they work? Like what? Like what's their social well, stance? Everybody in Poland is Catholic. Well, well, on Justice Party's platform is like Catholic. Is like Catholic integralism. Um, the monarchist party, the monarcho libertarian party, is also um, uh, kind of like more distributist um, uh, Catholic model. But um, I just did the math, and that's a whopping twenty-two seats with our current numbers and um, the number of representatives in Congress. That's more than we have now. <laughs> we could do it. United, uh, vote for uh, Mon, Mon Monar Okay, but we have to we have to come up with a very broad name. We'll call it Monarcho Social Libera Libera Conservatism. The the American uh, Monarcho Falangist Party of Catholic oh. of Catholic Integralists. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, since we have. Driven ourselves way off of where, uh, way off of Boris Johnson. Uh, I think we should probably uh, come close to wrapping up here. Uh, does anyone have anything uh, further to say? Uh, I mean, Boris Johnson, I'm just, this is going to be boring, but he's just going to be replaced by a faceless bureaucrat that can take orders from global finance. So don't be surprised when you get like a pretty Patel or somebody along that line in as the British Prime Minister. Some people have been talking about possibility of making Mog the head of the Conservative Party. Who? Jacob Rees Mog. He is a Roman Catholic who I want to say attends the Latin Mass. Oh, so uh, I, I doubt that would happen. Yeah, if he if he actually yeah. supports what the church says on any social issue, he's not going to survive in modern Britain. But apparently, he's got a very niche popularity, and he's also I can't remember if he himself is a noble or if his wife comes from nobility, but he's of title. 
I mean, well, um, that's something that's not that that's something that we can discuss if he actually does become the prime minister, which is a long shot. Yeah. Well, um, anyways, let's let's think, close. All right. So, oh wait. Darth, which, what were you gonna say? Uh, oh. Well, it's going to be somebody like Pat. That's literally what all the British are saying right now. So the Tories are just going to appoint some faceless, no no uh, personality type that can just take orders from the financial interests. All right. So uh, we all good to wrap up? Yep. All right. Um, so uh, either way, we should be praying for... Uh, uh, the conversion of England, and that uh, they pick somebody decent at any rate. Uh, well, good at any rate. But anyways, if you would like to uh, watch uh, our podcast live, then you can join our Discord. We record on Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a.k.a. the best time zone. Uh, you Eastern can also... Time, not Eastern Standard Time. It's just plain Eastern Time. Okay, it used to be called EST. I, I'm, I'm, I remember... I don't know. Maybe my memory's fuzzy, but I remember distinctly EST. Whatever. Anyways, uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, and a fair uh, number of you are probably uh, coming over from there because of a meme that uh, Will made. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, and I need to get that group link in there. I think oh, oh, the also, week. also before we go, um, uh, thank God for the Georgia Guidestone incident. Um, uh, it was a really great blow to the. Uh, to the uh, Freemasons in America. We need to discuss that next week because we completely forgot this week. Um, yeah, read, <laughs> look, look at some of the things that, that they suggested for the people who survived the nuclear war. Anyways, so uh, you can also find us on various things as well as there will be a uh, link to Darth's channel in the uh, subscription box below. And now, as is customary, we will conclude in prayer in the name of the Father and just of the Son. I just wanted to, uh, hold on, uh, Charles, I just wanted to make a personal announcement to everyone that I will most likely not be on the show next week due to another commitment. All right. Um, so, yeah, no, um, uh, no Vic uh, next week, probably. Um, so, uh, all right. So now we will conclude in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. And until next week, may God bless you. God bless and save the United States of America and also, uh, I guess, the United Kingdom and Japan.